It was Joseph Addison who said, Man is the merriest species of the creation. All above or below him are serious. Hello, this is Nelson Olmstead. I hope you have time to sit down, relax, and drink that second cup of coffee you've been promising yourself because there's nothing quite like relaxation to help you enjoy a good short story. The tale I want to tell you today was written by H. Gordon Green, and I think you'll like it. It's entitled, God and the Rooster. One morning last spring, a young bachelor of 30 stood in the barnyard and looked at the threatening skies. It was the last season, uh, the latest season Ontario had ever known. And now that the land was finally ready for seeding, the heavens refused to dry up. He was thinking if, if he could get some help, he might get that back 20 seated before the rain broke again. And just then he saw a car turning into the lane. He said to himself, now that new preacher they got to Stumptown, he, he ought to know better than bother farmers at a time like this. I don't go to church, no how. The reverend gentleman got out of the car. He was a young man himself, and he offered his hand and said, You're Johnny Bond. I'm glad to know you. I'm the new preacher. Uh, Sparks is my name. But you're very busy right now trying to get some seed in before it rains again, and you'd be glad if I'd be on my way. Look here, do you need some help? I need some exercise. Have you got another team needing the same thing? Well, you bet I have, said Johnny, after he'd smothered his surprise. Now, wait. There's a catch in it. My church needs pew warmers. If I work for you this morning, I want you to come to church Sunday. Well, I never did work overtime of going to church Sunday, and I never aimed to, but then I never aimed to see a preacher running a cultivator either. Okay, it's a deal. That noon, when they came up to the house from the fields, Johnny was puzzled. He said, What in the world would make a guy decide to wear his collar backwards? But don't you believe in religion, Johnny? I believe God helps them and helps themselves. And as far as the rest is concerned, it's just a bunch of fairy tales to keep the old woman calm. Well, what makes you think like that, Johnny? Never had any reason to think anything else. You pray over your vittles before you eat, but does it make them taste any better? And some folks, like my friend Holdham across the road, have been going to church since God made little apples, but it doesn't make them any better. Right now, he's entering a lawsuit against me because my line fence runs five feet over in his farm and I've cut down some of his trees. Look, Sparks, you seem a sensible guy. You really don't believe all that church stuff, do you? I'm a preacher because I believe in religion, Johnny. Well, Reverend, you can bless our seed grain, but if you really believed it was going to make it grow any better, you'd probably do a little farming yourself to help out with a missionary fund. Well, why, Johnny, well, that's it. Well, I'm sorry I have to go now. I, I've got to get to working in this idea you've given me. One idea. You come to church Sunday morning and you'll see... Well, Johnny Bond was at church the next Sunday, and so were a great many other people who hadn't seen the inside of a church since the last chicken supper. And there seemed to be a slight buzz of uncommon interest in the pews. The preacher announced, At the suggestion of one of our friends, the church is going into the farming business. Today, no collection will be taken. The collection plates have been piled with dollar bills. Each of you is invited to take five dollars each. This money is given to you to invest for the church in any way you see fit. The last Sunday in October, you will be asked to put back under the plate the earnings of your investment. We are leaving the accounting to you. No one's going to ask how much you bring back in October or whether or not you've kept your account straight. Some of you may think me very foolish and unbusinesslike, but I see no better way to propagate the faith and to put it on an actual everyday test. There's no doubt in my mind but that our faith shall be amply rewarded. Well, after the service, Johnny went up to the preacher and drew him aside, and he said, well, Where'd you get that money? Well, it was my own. I think you're nuts. You don't know faith. I know Stumptown. I'd like to bet you never see half of that money again. Are you investing too? Well, I didn't have five dollars worth of faith, but I, I did take three. Fine. This is your idea, you know. I was disappointed to see some of our people refuse to take the money. Yeah, I noticed my neighbor Holton was one of those that wouldn't bite. Now, now listen, Reverend. I know what you stand to lose. 
But I'm going to be strictly honest about this. And if I don't earn a cent in the investment, I'm not going to take something out of my own pocket just to make it look nice. And if I go in the hole, I'm going to tell you about it. You need to come down to earth, and I'll be hanged if I don't think this fool idea might be the very thing to make you do it. Well, that night, Johnny dug out the fire magazine and began looking over the advertisements. He said, I guess I'll get the Lord a setting of eggs with that money. But I can't have just ordinary stuff, or I'll get it mixed up with what's in the barnyard already. And before he went to bed, he'd written to one of Canada's leading poultry farms for a setting of eggs from their very best prize-winning stock. When the eggs came a week later, Johnny promptly put them under the best clucker he had. Three weeks later, out of 15 eggs, he got three bedraggled-looking chicks. Before the day was over, two of the three had given up the ghost, and the old hen, apparently disgusted, refused to acknowledge the other as her own. Well, Skeezix, said Johnny, you're going to have to lay an awful lot of eggs between now and the last day of October if you're to pay the Lord back his three dollars. But... A week or so later, it became evident that Skeezix would never lay any eggs. Skeezix had decided to become a rooster. Every night for the next month, Johnny put the chicken in a little box in the chair at the head of the bed, and he left the lamp burning all night to keep him warm. Johnny began his accounting with the following entry for the debit side. Extra coal oil, ten cents. When Skeezix was two months old, he decided to learn how to fly. The chicken fence was no more than a low hurdle to him, and Johnny would no sooner reach the fields in the morning than he would find Skeezix trotting along behind him, picking up stray crickets. Oh, danged if he ain't the beat of any bird I ever saw, said Johnny, with a note of affection. But there came a day when Johnny wasn't so affectionate. On that day, the rooster suddenly rose straight into the air like a helicopter and descended into a half a can of cream. And two days later, he and the cat had an argument outside the parlor window... And in the ensuing fracas, the rooster flew straight through a pane of fancy red and blue glass. And a week later, when Johnny backed the car out, Skeezy's got one leg under a wheel. Johnny held the dangling leg and said, Well, if you were my own, I'd wring your neck. But seeing as how you're the Lord's rooster, I suppose this calls for a special attention. He put the bird into the car and drove into town and took the bird to the veterinary. When Skeezy returned to the barnyard with a splint in his leg, Johnny built a special little pen for him on top of the duck house. But one morning, the rooster wasn't there. Johnny spent hours looking for the bird, and finally he heard that peculiar crow that could only belong to Skeezix coming from the Holton barnyard. Oh, that dang bird would pick a place like that for his vacation. Johnny muttered between his teeth as he shuffled up the Holton lane, dredging for words to say when he should meet Holton. But it wasn't Holton he saw first. It, it was a girl. And when he'd taken a second look at her, Johnny suddenly forgot all about the rooster. The girl was very pretty. And when he inquired about his bird, she laughed and said, Well, I, I guess we did see him. We were eating breakfast when he came strutting into the kitchen as important as the king's nephew, perched in the back of a chair and scolded us until we fed him. Now, by the way, I'm just a city slicker doing a little farming for my uncle. The name's Ellen. Who could you be? Well, Johnny told her, and he took a long time doing it. And that night, he purposely shut Skeezix out of his pen, and the next morning, he again visited the Holton farm to find his rooster. By the end of the week, Johnny was getting along quite well without the rooster's help, and it was scarcely a month later when Johnny asked the inevitable question. But Ellen said her uncle was furious at Johnny over the pending lawsuit, and he'd just have to be patient. He finally rolled off to sleep that night, but suddenly he was wide awake. Skeezix was at the bedroom window... And it wasn't morning, it was just past midnight. Johnny fumbled across to the window, and as he heaved it up, he became aware of a commotion in the duck pen. A minute later, still in his nightshirt, and armed with shotgun and flashlight, Johnny threw open the door of the pen. The beam of light revealed the startled faces of two boys, whom Johnny had once recognized as two of Stumptown's less civilized characters. They had two big ducks in their bag, and Johnny learned that the rest of the gang were over at Holtham's getting a turkey. Johnny took the boys into the house and grabbed the phone. Hold him, he bellowed. Grab your gun and get out to your turkey shed. You got visitors. Half an hour later, Johnny was over at the Holdham farm with, with his two captives. Mr. Holdham hadn't caught the rest of the gang, but all his turkeys were safe. He said, are you going to call the cops or take these two boys in? But that wasn't Johnny's idea at all. Well, what these guys need is to fork a few thousand sheaves of grain. He turned to the boys. 
If you mugs want to work on the farm till harvest is over, we'll keep quiet. Otherwise... Well, the boys suddenly became very enthusiastic about farm life. Johnny said, Okay, use us right and we'll use you right. Which one do you want, Hold'em? Well, I've been doing all right without one so far. Maybe so, but you're going to lose your pretty niece pretty soon. I'm going to marry her. Hold'em didn't know what to say. So Johnny went back home and took both boys with him. The next morning, Hold'em was at his back door, and he said, I've been thinking it over some, and I figure I'd better take one of those boys. Pretty decent thing for you to call me up last night. Save me some money. And uh, seeing as how we're going to be related soon, I guess there's no use arguing anymore. Uh, could we shake hands? Well, sometime in September, Reverend Sparks came out to Johnny's again for a bit of exercise, and Johnny took down the calendar and showed the preacher his account. And this is the way he had it figured. Debit. Coal oil, ten cents. Half can cream all shot, three twenty-five. Half half pane of glass busted, one twenty-nine. Veterinary bill, a dollar. Feed estimated thirty-two cents. Total, five dollars and ninety-six cents. Credit, two ducks saved, three fifty. Lawsuit headed off, fifty dollars. One hired man corralled, priceless. Wife located, even more priceless. He said. It's a good thing you can't put a price tag in those last two items, but even the way it is, it looks like I'll be putting $47.54 in the plate next month. And the preacher laughed. But you haven't finished your calculation yet. You still have to add on whatever the rooster brings. Yeah, but I'm not selling him. There isn't enough money in Stumptown to buy that bird. It's still the Lord's rooster. And if you warn him, you'll have to pay the plate whatever he'd bring. Yeah, I guess that's right. Well, he's probably worth about 30 cents a pound. Okay, I'll weigh them up. But I'm not parting with them. Well, just then, a big car drove up, and a pompous-looking man said to Johnny, I uh, <clears throat> want to buy that rooster. Brown leggings are a hobby of mine, and that's a fine bird you got there. Legs a little crooked, but it won't hurt him for breeding. I'll give you $15 for him. Johnny groaned miserably. And the preacher said merrily, <laughs> Whether you take it or not, it's still $15 more for the plate. The big man was impatient. Well, make it $20. Oh, no, Johnny groaned again. I, I, I really couldn't take it. Look here. Here's $25. That's as high as I'll go. <laughs> I can't sell him and don't offer me any more. He's a pet and money wouldn't buy him. And please don't waste any more time here. Y you make me nervous. Well, when the last Sunday in October came around, Johnny was in church. And while his charming wife sat beside him in the pew and held a collection plate, Johnny forked out $72.54. And he smiled as he did it. You have heard a short story by H. Gordon Green entitled God and the Rooster. Now here is Nelson Olmstead. Well, I first presented this H. Gordon Green story about a year and a half ago, at which time it created a rather surprising reaction from listeners who've never stopped requesting it to be presented again. Several churches, I've been told, tried the idea suggested in the story, but I regret that no one wrote to tell me how the experiments turned out. I hope you've enjoyed hearing it today. This is Nelson Olmstead saying goodbye and good reading. Nelson Olmsted has presented another great short story from the world of literature. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.